March 1990, and the clamor of three rotary engines rattles the windows of Christchurch. This morning, the city is witnessing the reenactment of a great moment in New Zealand history. The arrival of the first aircraft to cross the Tasman Sea. That initial journey on September the 10th, 1928, had taken more than 14 hours. Two generations later, the crowds turn out to welcome another trans-Tasman visitor. But Concord has made the trip from Sydney in little more than one hour. In a single lifetime, aviation has conquered New Zealand's isolation from itself and the rest of the world. the motor car had promised, the aeroplane would finally deliver to New Zealand, the conquest of a difficult and remote land at the end of the earth. New Zealanders, especially in isolated rural areas, were among the first to see the potential of travel through the air. By the time Percy Fisher's monoplane was filmed near Greytown in the Wairarapa in 1913, we had been taking to the air for a quarter of a century in everything from balloons to box kites. It's even possible a New Zealander was the first man anywhere to achieve powered flight. In March 1903, an unknown Tamuka farmer had coaxed a much more primitive machine into the air, nine months before the Wright brothers first flew. But today there's much debate about what was achieved by Richard William Pierce. I think his own words have got to be considered here when he himself quite openly says and frankly says that when the history of aviation is written that preeminence must be given to the Wright brothers because they were the first to achieve powered flight. That is flight, powered flight, an aircraft taking off from a level surface and landing on a surface now alone of one it took off from and being under control for the whole period of its flight. Now Pierce freely admits he never did that. What is clear is that Pierce was a genius. Working entirely on his own, he invented the aileron and built a vertical takeoff machine. But he lived and died in obscurity. He never got the recognition he deserved. It was in Auckland eight years later that Vivian Walsh made what's recognized as our first controlled flight in the Manorewa, an imported Kitsi. And the first man to go anywhere by plane was Will Scotland. Early in 1914, he flew the 75 kilometers from Invercargill to Gore. Only a few months later, though, Will Scotland would be flying off to war. The Great War created an enormous demand for fighting men and for new, more powerful weapons. Very quickly, the aeroplane developed from a fragile tangle of wood and wire into a fast, efficient killing machine. Before long, Britain was calling on her far-flung dominions for more men. New Zealand was ready. Within a year of the outbreak of war, Leo Walsh and his brother Vivian had set up a flying school in Auckland. The chief instructor was George Bolt, a man who would guide New Zealand aviation for 50 years. The school was based on the Auckland waterfront at Kohimarama. Naturally, the Walsh brothers opted for flying boats. By now, the Walsh brothers were building their own planes, along with Curtis aircraft imported from the United States. The training they provided was the equal of anything the Empire could offer. 
Amazingly, the men had to pay for their own tuition and their keep. 125 pounds, a small fortune. I think um, my father and his kind in those days were very much of the practical rather than the academic breed. They learned all they were ever to know about aviation just by doing it. And I think they, uh, they learned rather well. They made a tremendous contribution in their day, but they did it, uh, one has to concede, in a pattern, in a way which would hardly fit in today's highly specialised and high technology aviation scene. For George Bolton and his colleagues, the end of the fighting in 1918 meant the start of a different struggle for survival. The Auckland Flying School and a rival school at Sockburn and Christchurch had pilots and aircraft galore, but no work. To make a living, they turned to show business, to joyriding. They started up this motor and she sort of moved out into the water and gathered a bit of speed and threw spray everywhere and soaked me to the skin. Lifted in a bit into the air and we went out towards Rangatoto, circled around a bit. I wouldn't think we were very high, you know, it'd only be two or three hundred feet probably. To me it was just an experience, you know. I mean, I had no idea what aviation was or anything of that sort. It was just, somebody said, have a go, so I had to go. Joyriding financed more serious ventures. In both the North and South Islands, the schools and others pioneered mail and passenger services. But the companies were separated by more than just rivalry. Cook Strait was too wide and its weather too unpredictable for the early flyers to take it on with confidence. Until August 1920, no one even attempted it. Then, on a fine winter's day, it was crossed from the south by Captain Ewan Dixon of the Canterbury Aviation Company. Even years later, in the 1930s, pilots still treated Cook Strait with respect. It was a crossing, a big water crossing, and a one engine, and if anything happened, didn't have much show. So there was a system of air traffic control, which may sound funny today, that we had to obey. For instance, the flying from the North Island, one had to circle the railway station at Taikokariki and wait for the station master or one of his henchmen to come out and unfold a big white cloth cross, which notified that you had been seen. And he would keep a log of time and date and so on. Captain Dixon's triumph had shown that passenger services between the main centres were now possible. But it would be another ten years before New Zealanders took aviation seriously enough to start scheduled services. The British were quick to recognise the value of air travel. During the 1920s, there was instant fame for anyone who could clip a couple of days off the trip to Australia. One of the most daring was a 27-year-old New Zealander, Oscar Garden. He had almost no experience, but still he planned to fly to Sydney in a second-hand gypsy moth. Somebody said, well, you should go up to the Havilands and uh, get some advice from their engineers, which I did. I got hold of a man from the storage department told him what my plans were, and I said, uh, I, I can't spend, afford to spend a lot of money, but uh, what do you think I should take, the, uh, the, the absolute essentials I should take for the engine in case of trouble? He said, well, he, he said, the, the, at least I'd advise you to take two valve springs and two spare valves. And he said, uh, he said uh, you'd be lucky if you got to Australia without uh, losing at least one valve spring, or perhaps burning a valve out. So with homemade maps and a pocket full of spares, Oscar Garden set off down the Empire route to Sydney. He had several near disasters, but he had his share of good luck too. I nearly skipped doing the engine. I was so tired. I, had a, I think I had 12 hours altogether that day. And um, then I thought, oh gosh, I, the next day's the time or sea, and all the sharks are there. If you come down, you've had it. It wouldn't have made any difference. But uh, I, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll just have to 
pull my finger out and, and have a look at the engine to be sure. And I got, uh, we got two petrol drums out. I stood on one, he st I got the head man to stand on the other to hold the torch, and I got the valve cover off and checked it all, different things, checked that the propeller belts were tight and different things. And blew me down, I found two broken valve springs and one burnt out valve. Solo flyers could always be certain of a rousing welcome in Sydney. This earlier flight by Bert Hinkler had been completed in 15 and a half days. Oscar Garden took 18. Garden completed his trip to New Zealand by sea. He was welcomed in Wellington like a returning hero. But the celebrations had a slightly hollow ring. He'd flown only as far as Australia. The stormy Tasman Sea still sealed off New Zealand from its neighbour. The first to attempt a crossing were two New Zealanders, Lieutenant John Moncrief and Captain George Hood. They planned to make the attempt in a Ryan monoplane, similar to the one used by Charles Lindbergh on his historic flight from New York to Paris a few months earlier. They set off for New Zealand on January the 10th, 1928. At Wellington's Trentham Racecourse, a huge crowd gathered that evening to welcome them. The spectators and the men's wives waited in vain. In their eagerness to write their names into history, Hood and Moncrief had rushed their attempt. Their single-engined plane had logged only 10 hours before they set off. The Tasman had claimed its first and only pioneer aviators. Charles Kingsford Smith learned from Hood and Moncrief's mistakes. His three-engined plane had already proved itself across the Pacific, and Kingsford Smith was a veteran long-distance flyer. Even so, his crossing on September the 10th, 1928, was a close thing. He had to fight through the worst weather of his career. We were all talking away and wondering what was going to happen, and all of a sudden somebody said, there they are. And away out in the distance, over Christchurch, we saw this great plane, this huge wing, like the wings of an eagle spread right out, and everybody became tremendously enthusiastic and jumping up and down and the plane circled over the drone and then came down onto the grass. Hats and hands and handkerchiefs are breaking through in places. We'd never seen or heard anything like this plane before, never in New Zealand. And the roar of these three big motors was simply terrific, deafening. The Southern Cross had earned her place in New Zealand history, and so had the crew. In Christchurch that day, Charles Kingsford Smith belonged as much to New Zealand as to Australia. But the challenge of a single engine crossing remained. Another Australian, Guy Menzies, made his attempt from Sydney on the 7th of January, 1931, without telling us all. I was detailed to prepare his aircraft and he came round, had very little to say and we all thought that he was going to purr, but he, he was leaving tonight, right. Come midnight, I was there to see him off and he said, right, oh, we'll go, and I'll go now. So off he went, down the runway, took off, circled Sydney and went over the ta out to the Tasman. Well, I said to people around me, he's going the wrong way. Which was how he landed in New Zealand. The field he chose for his landing near Hokitika was really a swamp. Menzies was bruised and embarrassed, but triumphant. There was nothing secretive about the style of Francis Chichester. Like Oscar Garden, He'd arrived here by sea after flying from London to Sydney. His gypsy moth didn't have the range to fly the Tasman direct, 
but by hopping from island to island, he thought he could cross from east to west against the prevailing winds. I was told he was at Hobson when I went down and uh, uh, saw the, um, his plane with the uh, floats on, had a chat with him on the slipway. I was just puzzled how he uh, was going to navigate with a sextant. You've got to have a sort of dead steady platform. Exact navigation was the key to finding his first landfall, Norfolk Island. The only way he could fix his position would be by using a sextant to take accurate sightings of the sun. On the roads around Hobsonville, Chichester practiced as best he could. Chichester would have to find two pinpricks in the ocean. Norfolk Island, then Lord Howe Island before heading for the Australian coast. For most of the trip, the sun was hidden by dense cloud. Even so, his calculations were exactly right. Less than six hours after leaving New Zealand, he spotted Norfolk Island dead ahead. Before he'd even reached Australia, Chichester had made his name. The astonished locals who helped him tie up were witnessing one of the great moments in aviation history. Chichester had risked his life to prove that using only instruments, aircraft could be navigated over vast distances with complete accuracy. By the time Gene Batten touched down at Mangere in 1936, Tasman crossings had become almost routine. What made her arrival special was that hers was the first direct flight from Britain, and she'd completed the journey in only 10 days. That immaculate little plane coming in so nonchalantly again and this petite little woman just stepping out there just as if she'd stepped out of a shop window, you know, and peeling her helmet off and her beautiful flowing hair. I can still remember it, you know. Quite a remarkable experience, you know. Her triumph had all the right ingredients to capture the imagination of the public. She was brave, she was beautiful, and most important, she was ours. New Zealand aviation finally took off in the 1930s. Flying was, as it still is today, is entertainment and is one of the greatest shows that you can have if it's well done. Every Sunday afternoon, that was two o'clock was display time and uh, consisted of what we used to call crazy flying, of course, which was throwing the aeroplane into all sorts of different attitudes. And in the days pre-war, the tram car uh, used to go right past Rongatai on its way to Seaturn. And trams carry a hell of a lot of people, like something like 60 or anything. And the people used to pour out there in the trams and, and the cars on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, knowing that the Aero Club would have put on a show for them. They would be aerobatics, not only that, they would be joyrides. The joyrides were fairly quick and fast, but usually 10 shillings each, or for the young bloods who wanted a bit more thrills in the aerobatic flights, used to be a pound, and one used to work uh, depending on the size of the paddock and whether one had to spend much time taxing in relation to the amount of time in the air. One could get in six or eight flights in the hour, perhaps in the aerobatics, and made it really worthwhile. Worthwhile enough to coax Charles Kingsford Smith across the Tasman twice more during the early 30s. The depression was at its height, but somehow most people could scrape together 10 shillings for a quick spin aboard the old bus. Of course, they were working on a shoestring, you've got to remember. They just put these banana crates, I suppose the simplest thing they could get, and they just put them along each side of the, what you would call the cabin, I don't know, the inside of the thing. Then they just sat as many as they felt safe, as many as they could get quits. And <laughs> they just put them in there and, and we did these flights. But she was a magnificent old thing, you know, although to look at her, she really looked battered up, you know, because she was patched and patched and patches on top of patches. For several more years, the Southern Cross would be the largest aircraft in New Zealand skies. A joyride was the closest anyone would get to a true passenger flight. 
But while they still had their limitations, in 1931, aircraft had already proved their worth in an emergency. We received word that morning at the Auckland Aero Club that there had been a major earthquake in Napier. And uh, I don't know who would, would have thought of the idea, but that they, whether it was the this end or the other end of Napier, that water supply would probably be a problem and that they would probably need some chlorine and so forth for purification. And uh, they asked, could some chlorine cylinders be flown to, to uh, Hastings? There was no aerodrome at Napier in those days. So we said, yes, we could cope. We had three aircraft which we could uh, make available. So they loaded us up with uh, chlorine cylinders in the front of the gypsy moths, strapped them in as tightly as we could, because as you know, they weigh fairly heavy. And we only had uh, three ply or five ply floors. And uh, off we went. Oh, it was a shocking sight, really. Uh, smoke still burning and everything going on. And buildings around Bluff Hill, you could see everything tumble down. It really was a horrific sight from the air, something that I don't think any of us had ever experienced anything like it, which made it all the worse in our view. Only four years after the Napier earthquake, Ron Kirkup was again flying over the same crumpled landscape. By now, the circumstances were very different. At last, small airlines were starting passenger services, and no region needed them more than Hawke's Bay. We used to form convoys of cars, and they used to wait around just outside on the outskirts of Gisborne and follow the service cars through to Napier. And that's why, you know, of the very isolation of Gisborne, that's why when the East Coast Airways started, and Ron Kirk and his boys uh, started the airline there, that we felt isolation at Ender. We had no radio, and we relied on weather reports, if necessary, considered necessary by telephone. And uh, we sometimes would get caught out, for instance, if the Wellington Express didn't arrive in Napier, the railway, too late, behind time, uh, perhaps a headwind, perhaps uh, running into darkness. Uh, to, as an aid to landing, the engineer would uh, put hurricane lamps on, sitting on top of the fence posts along where we had to come to land so that we wouldn't give us some idea of the height of the ground and also we wouldn't strike the fence. The slow but steady twin engine to Havilland were the backbone of the new passenger services. They began to appear everywhere, even over Cook Strait, where one of the earliest pioneers started Cook Strait Airways. My good friend George Bolt asked me what I go down and give them a handout, which I did do, in Cook Strait Airways, which uh, I found excellent, although very testing, flying in the, uh, that, that route, Wellington, Glidden, Nelson, and the West Coast, as far as I could take it. What I remember every, uh, every morning was my father getting up at six o'clock in the morning and going outside in his uh, slippers and dressing gown, reading thermometers in the wet grass and uh, having a look at the sky and ringing someone up and that was the weather set for the day. And uh, it seemed to work very well. The biggest operation, Union Airways, was launched by the famous shipping companies. Union used the four-engine de Havilland Express on the main route. At the other end of the scale was the almost legendary Bert Mercer. Oh, Bert was a real lovely old gentleman, a real pioneer in the true sense of the word. He's another one foresaw the part that aviation could play in New Zealand, particularly to those outlying places. Hence his interest in the west coast, where he used to land on riverbeds and land at the Haas and Arrowwater and places like that. He really did some fantastic pioneering work there, uh, work that I don't think has ever really been fully recognised. Bert proved that using the right type of aeroplane, you could service practically anywhere you wanted to, providing you did it sensibly, and he did that. This is before helicopter days, of course. He proved that these aircraft, used sensibly, could service most places in New Zealand. 
Throughout the 1930s, the British and Americans jostled for supremacy of the air routes. The Americans were pushing south through the Pacific, while the British had their well-established Empire route to Australia. It was no accident they adopted similar aircraft for the task. To the British, the flying boat offered the ideal vehicle for servicing a far-flung empire. It was fast, safe and comfortable. Falling. You can hear the four engines roaring. She's very near to the water now. In fact, she's just a foot or so above the water and she's just breaking the But the, the first flying now. boat to touch down on Auckland's Waitemata Harbour in March 1937 was American. A Sikorsky, piloted by Captain Edward Music. New Zealand was thrilled and deeply impressed. To us in New Zealand, that flight would have been almost the equivalent of putting those men on the moon. But the American triumph was soon to be tinged with tragedy. On a later trip, the crew all died when the aircraft exploded near Pangapanga. The British had lost the race, but Imperial Airways pressed ahead with their own survey flight to New Zealand. They chose a New Zealander, Captain John Burgess, to command this, the world's longest commercial flight. The aircraft was an Empire-class flying boat, the Centaurus. The four-engine giants had already proved their worth on the route to South Africa and had even crossed the Atlantic. When the Centaurus appeared over Auckland on December the 27th, 1937, it was the best Christmas present New Zealand could have hoped for. Welcome to the Centaurus, Imperial Airways first trip to New Zealand. She's shooting right up the harbour, nice scene to be traveling in tremendous speed still, hasn't she, John? Yes. Is that somewhere now, halfway up the King's Wharf from downstairs? And John Sandwich has brought this collapse, did you hear it? That's the first crash John Sandwich has had for a long time. He had no parachute with him either. The whole crew, I think we realized that this arrival of the Centaurus was to break the isolation of New Zealand from the rest of the world, especially the UK. For Burgess and his crew, there was only one slightly sour note. The Americans were already there, now making their second visit. We saw that we had been beaten to the post by Captain Edward Seen Music, and we realized that we were second. The same, I would think, as, as Captain Scott in the early days of the pole realized when he had arrived at the pole, there was Amazon's flag. The next time John Burgess flew into Auckland, two years later, it was as commander of New Zealand's very first international passenger aircraft, the Aotearoa. The government had ordered three flying boats for a new service across the Tasman, operated by Tasman Empire Airways. But within a month, the cheerful crowds who turned out to welcome Captain Burgess would learn that Britain and her empire were at war with Germany. Britain would be fighting for her survival. In fact, she would be able to spare only two of the promised aircraft. When John Burgess took up his new post as chief pilot of Tasman Empire Airways, his total fleet consisted of those two flying boats. Throughout the war, the Aotearoa and the Awarua were New Zealand's only passenger link with the outside world. A flight to Sydney was regarded as the ultimate luxury. It was just so different. I mean, it was a, a, um, a very exciting, a very romantic, and visually a, a fantastic experience. Particularly if you were sitting on the 
on the lower deck as I was, and as this plane started to move away from the um, platform that it was next to, and this an amazing feeling as to how this great big monstrous thing was going to lift off the ground, and then off it would slowly rise up, and away you'd go. You had this um, uh, you know, sense that, well, you just did, you dressed up as if you were going to LSD race course. The thrills were not confined to the passengers. Teal's pilots were crossing one of the world's most turbulent seas with very little backup. Safety margins were slender. I got a, a, a crook weather forecast. They, they, you couldn't blame the weather office because they didn't have enough access to information in those days. And uh, we struck a very bad headwind halfway across the Tasman and uh, we couldn't turn back. It, it meant going. And it took us 12 hours, 10 minutes to reach Sydney. And the engineer said we had about five minutes petrol left. Flying boat passengers might have appeared slightly less relaxed if they'd known the truth about the Empire flying boats or the Sandringans that followed them. Their designers had never intended them to be used over great distances across open sea. They were built for coastal operation and short hops between lakes and rivers. On the Tasman route, they were working at the limit of their capability. They were the best at the time. Captain Burgess praised them up no end and said they were ideal. They only needed a feather duster to clean them off, which was far from true. But uh, they did a noble job, those two flying boats, you know. The war in the Pacific brought New Zealanders into contact with a completely new type of aircraft the C-47, alias the DC-3. And for many Kiwis, it was love at first sight. Well, the story goes that this American captain brought the C-47, as they call them, into Whanuapai uh, in the afternoon and said, well, we'll do transition tomorrow morning. And he went to town to see some of the highlights of Auckland. And meanwhile, uh, Popeye Lucas and Billy Tagan, the both squadron leaders, looked at this big gurney bird and says, well, Bill, let's, uh, let's fly it. So they walked around it and read the book a couple of times and then took it off and did a circuit. So when the American came next morning to start his transition, the boy said, no bother, we've done it. We thought we were in clay when we got DC-3s. We'd had a lot of rubbish up till then. The DC-3 was the world's first truly cost-effective aircraft this had not escaped the men who flew them. A group of us had the idea at the end of the war to start our own airline and we did a lot of work on and had the finances virtually settled and uh, I went down to see Peter Fraser to see exactly what the government reaction would be and we were given a, a very terse and abrupt answer. Uh, Fraser said to me and I still recall his words, he said, Patterson, if you and your people want to fly after the war there's only one way you're going to do it and that's with National Airways because we will not permit any private operations. So that's the end of that speed. At the end of the war, the small airlines around New Zealand were nationalised. Their aircraft and routes were taken over by the new National Airways Corporation. After a facelift for civilian flying, the DC-3s would enjoy a new lease on life. And so would the flight crews. From transport squadron to... Uh, NAC all happened on April the 1st, 1947. And we just changed from Air Force into uh, NAC uniform. And get the advantage of a little more money than the Air Force paid us. But we virtually flew the same routes. Now for the first time, anyone could fly in New Zealand, quickly and safely. All you needed was a ticket. Uh, the skipper used to, and the crew, used to spend half the time in the back chatting to the customers. Once you put the old DC-3 up to 8,500 feet and put the automatic pilot in, there was no sweat. Passenger numbers began to mushroom. At last, 
ordinary New Zealanders could consummate their long love affair with the aeroplane. A rise in passenger numbers after the war created serious problems for Teal. At first, the new model flying boat, the Sandringham, couldn't cope with conditions over the Tasman. We didn't have the full feathering air screw, so the engine kept turning around, the wind milling around, we shut off all power, but the vibration was so much. When we arrived in New Zealand, I limped in on three engines, they had to replace 2,000 rivets in the wing alone and, of course, change the engine was finished. When the Sandringhams were finally pensioned off, Teal could start to expand at last. In 1949, the Coral Route was born. This route through the islands to Tahiti became possible when Teal started flying Solent's, the last of the great flying boats. Long after other airlines had switched to land-based planes, government policy kept Teal planted on the water. But against the odds, the coral route turned this disability to stunning advantage. The route is still remembered as one of the most romantic journeys anywhere in the world. The highlight of the trip was the brief stopover at Akiyami, an atoll in the Cook Islands. And that was where I think they refueled, but they came out and collected us off the flying boat, and we were taken into this gorgeous little atoll where you could put your bathing suit on, and they covered you with lays, and they had this marvellous uh, luncheon for you here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you know, and you, you just there's the flying boat sitting out there in the water, and there you are in this atoll. It, it was something dreamlike, you know, just totally dreamlike. The Solents were the only aircraft serving Tahiti at the time. So when a flying boat touched down, the locals were almost as excited as the passengers. Tahiti was absolutely gorgeous. It was a very different lifestyle. It was more relaxed. It gave us the opportunity to, of course, purchase vast amounts of French perfume at next to no price. We used to bath in it almost. A different lifestyle altogether, much more fun, and an exotic type of female that we'd never ever come across in New Zealand. But New Zealand was missing out badly on all other international routes. Until Teal inherited some DC-6 airliners in the mid-1950s, it didn't even own a pressurized aircraft. At least the Tasman could now be crossed in comfort. In fact, many would envy some features of the old DC-6s even today. But the move to land-based aircraft meant New Zealand would need bigger and better airports. Wellingtonians literally had to move mountains to develop Rongatai Airport. When visiting aircraft dropped in to celebrate his opening day, it began to look as though the water might be safer after all. First, a Sunderland tore out its belly along the new runway. Then the pilot of an RAF Vulcan bomber badly misjudged his approach. The pilot managed to land at Ohakia. Soon, New Zealand would have jet aircraft of her own. In 1958, Teal introduced Electra prop jets. They still travelled no further than Australia, though, and even the name Teal meant little overseas. So I came back and I told the directors here 
I said, we're known as Tasmanian Airways, which is all wrong. Why don't we change? We're going a bit international now. Why don't we change it to Air New Zealand? And they said, good idea. We'll put it forward at the bo next board meeting. And it was changed on my birthday, funnily enough. <laughs> Aviation finally came of age in New Zealand on November the 24th, 1965. That was the day Air New Zealand moved into its new base at Mangere. Star of the show was Britain's new de Havilland Comet. But Air New Zealand had chosen an American aircraft, the Douglas DC-8, as its flag carrier. With this long-range jet, we could go anywhere and take on the established airlines for the first time. The arrival of the wide-bodied DC-10 in 1973 introduced the age of mass transport and mass tourism. It was the search for new tourist excursions that took Air New Zealand to Antarctica and the greatest tragedy in our aviation history. Passengers set out to enjoy sightseeing flights over the last truly isolated place on Earth. One flight ended in disaster on Mount Erebus. There have been no more trips into the unknown. Today, the skies over New Zealand are crowded and competitive. New Zealand's airline jostles for position at home and abroad. Yet surprisingly, in the quarter century since Mangere opened, the speed of scheduled services has barely changed. Most of the time in the air now, between even Auckland Christchurch, which is our longest haul, the total chock to chock time is only about one hour twenty, the air time is only about fifty minutes. Uh, much of that speed in climb and descent, and the actual at cruise time is so short that by stepping the speed up, say, from 430 mile an hour to 600 mile an hour, it's not going to get there any quicker. It may lop a minute off. What has changed is the web of technology that cushions the movements of modern aircraft. Jumbos routinely operate in conditions that would have torn the Southern Cross to pieces. If there's one thing that's missing from air travel today, it's the sense of adventure tinged with danger that inspired the pioneers. Most flights to and from New Zealand still cross the Tasman, once the most feared of the great water crossings. Now, wind and rain mean nothing to trans-Tasman passengers, insulated in their metal cocoon. The crossing to Australia is one of the shortest of our international flights. It's barely long enough for a meal and a nap. Nothing about today's aircraft would have surprised the great pioneer aviators like George Bolt. Back in the days of wood and canvas, Bolt predicted exactly how aircraft would develop. He said, in years to come, when you grow up, really high-performance aircraft will have delta-shaped wings like that. And he said, uh, large aircraft that are uh, built for carrying things long distances, they're going to have swept-back wings. I didn't take too much notice, but I remember him uh, building me paper gliders to demonstrate the point, and I'd, I'd have to concede 20, 30, 40 years later, then uh, they all did have shapes like that. To rediscover the adventure of flight in New Zealand, you have to go back to basics. Learning to fly is as great a challenge as ever it was. 
Each new generation can still experience the heady mixture of fear and excitement that inspired the pioneers to reach for the skies.